this passage uh, follows on from um, the account of Jesus going from village to village, teaching people and sending out the disciples to preach the good news. And it also follows on from the story we heard a couple of weeks ago about the healing of Jairus' daughter. So this is Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 19. King Herod had heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod, and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed. But because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. I don't know how many of you are fond of soap operas on the telly. Uh, I must admit I'm not. I did used to watch Coronation Street, but once Ina Sharples and Minnie Caldwell and Martha Longhurst left, that did it for me. But... This is a soap opera. We've got some minor royalty with a very complicated history of marital relationships. We've got a drunken birthday party with all the top people in the area, including the military people. We've got the equivalent of pole dancing from the first century AD. And finally, we have a beheading, a brutal murder. That sounds like an episode of EastEnders to me. But the passage this morning starts with these words. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. The first question we need to ask is, what is it he'd heard? And I've said just now, it was the sending out of the disciples by Jesus and all the miracles that had been performed by Jesus and his disciples. And people were speculating about what was going on. And what is the identity of this person who's behind it all? They could clearly see that something supernatural was happening. Because no normal human could surely do these things. So was it Elijah who returned? Or a new prophet like one from the past? Or even John the Baptist back from the dead? And it's this last suggestion that really alarms Herod. And he says, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. So this is our introduction to the full details of the death of John the Baptist. 
And it's an interesting story, and it is not strictly about Jesus. But because John is such an important figure, as one who made the way ready for Jesus, Mark includes it in his account. Well, I hope you like history, because we need to understand who these characters are and the background of what's going on so we can get a better grasp of things. Now, the Herod in this story is Herod Antipas. He was the ruler of this part of Israel, which was all under Roman rule. And he was the son of Herod the Great, who held the title King of the Jews. And he was the one, when Jesus was a child, who ordered the murder of all the little children in Bethlehem. That's Herod the Great, this Herod's father. Herod Antipas had married his brother's wife, Herodias. And according to John, this marriage was unlawful according to the law in Leviticus. This really annoyed Herodias so much she wanted to kill him, to kill John. But for me, the key verse in this whole passage is verse 20. Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Herod Antipas was obviously a very complex person. We learn his reaction about hearing about Jesus, that he thinks maybe he's John returned from the dead. He believes in the resurrection of the dead. So he's got some grasp of what possibilities exist. He recognizes that John is a righteous and a holy man. And he likes to listen to him. But he's puzzled by what he hears. So he's presented with truth by John. But he won't fully accept it. And I think this is true of many people. They are interested in what Jesus says, but they're puzzled as well. Why is this? I think Jesus gives an answer in the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, 22, which says this, the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. So we now come to the critical part of the passage the detail of the circumstances of the death of John. Herod's giving a banquet to celebrate his birthday. It's the, the great and the good, and maybe not so good, are all there, all the top people. And I expect it was a very uh, boisterous occasion where copious amounts of wine were consumed by the men, because it was primarily men. Into, step, into the scene steps Herod's daughter, Her, Herod's stepdaughter, Salome. She dances in such a, a provocative way that Herod, Herod is excited what he sees. He's dazzled by her. And in his excited and probably drunken state, he makes this offer to her. You can have whatever you want, up to half my kingdom. She's very canny. Is Salome. She goes to her mother and says, Mother, what shall I ask for? Herodias seizes her opportunity and says, Straight away, ask for the head of John the Baptist. Herod's backed into a corner. He couldn't be seen to lose face. Society at that time was a lot of it for important people was about not losing face. You could not afford to lose face. Having the respect of others, your equals in society, was important. There are, of course, notable exceptions. If you remember from the two weeks ago, those who were here, I talked about Jairus and his daughter. And remember Jairus, 
comes to Jesus and falls on his knees before Jesus. He was not afraid to set his dignity aside because he trusted Jesus. It didn't matter who saw him kneeling at Jesus' feet. It wasn't important to him. He set aside his dignity. He lost face. He wasn't bothered. He wanted to be there with Jesus. But Herod's trapped by his own drunken foolishness. The passage tells us he was distressed in the situation that he found himself in. But he couldn't lose face in front of all these important people. So he orders the the executioner to go and kill John. How terrible to be trapped by such pride that he could order the death of someone else. Are we ever trapped by pride? Do we ever avoid losing face at the expense of something that ought to matter more than our pride? Dare we ever admit when we're wrong? Or dare we stand up against what is wrong and be considered foolish? There is, of course, one moment when Herod finally meets Jesus. This is after Jesus has been arrested. And Luke records this meeting. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he'd been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. Herod has fallen even further than the place he was before. From someone who seemed to have a genuine interest in the message of John the Baptist, all he wants now is to see Jesus perform some miracle, as if Jesus was simply there to perform for him. The trouble with sin is that if it's not dealt with at its outset, then things will deteriorate, things will fester. And this is what's happened in Herod's life. He's gone down and down and down. Jesus is silent. He has nothing to say to the shallow man who murdered his cousin. As Ecclesiastes puts it, there is a time to be silent and a time to speak. The last verse of our passage records that John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Was this the end? No. A new chapter in the story of salvation and the coming of God's kingdom is beginning. Sometimes we may think that the end of something is final. It seldom is. God is always ready to begin something new. We simply have to trust and be alert to what the Holy Spirit is saying and then be ready to act. So here's a quick reminder of my three main points, things to ponder perhaps in this coming week. Number one, if we hear the good news about Jesus, we need to respond to it immediately, not put it to one side for later. Secondly, are we willing to put pride to one side and appear foolish for what is just and true? And thirdly, can we look beyond what seems to be the end of something good and seek what may be better? Amen.